Hello, everyone. A very good evening to all of you and welcome to Masterclass 2.0 Data Storm 2.0. Data Storm 2.0 is organized by the Rotaract Club of the University of Moratua in collaboration with the Rotaract Club of the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo and is powered by Octave, the John Kills Group's Data and Advanced Analytics Center of Excellence. DataStorm is a platform to retain passionate individuals in the field of data science and to give them the strength to tackle data analytics case successfully. So as we all, as you all know, we conducted a series consisting of five phases, mainly the introductory webinar series and also the previous round, the storming round. And now this is Masterclass 2.0 organized exclusively for our talented 15 finalists who have made so far. So we are delighted to see all the uh, enthusiastic team members participating with high spirits despite the hardships that we are facing these days. And today's session is exclusively for you all. The 15 teams who made it so far all the way until Masterclass 2.0. So today we will be mainly focusing on data processing and visualization techniques, exploratory data analytics, and uh, giving you a brief introduction to the insurance domain, as well as guidelines for a Viva presentation, which you will be facing at the final round. To steer us through these topics, we have three outstanding personalities from Octave, the John Kills Group's Advanced Data and Analytics Center of Excellence. Present here today and let me introduce each one of them to you. First of all, let me welcome Dr. Rajatha Navaratna, Principal Data Scientist from Octave, who extended a big helping hand to conducting Masterclass 1.0 as well. It is our utmost pleasure and honor to have you here with us today, sir. Once again, welcome to Masterclass 2.0. Thanks, David. Pleasure to have you. Yes. Let us also welcome Mr. Tiraj Silva, data scientist of Octave. Thank you very much for joining with us today, sir. And, welcome uh, to be on board. Yes, it's a pleasure to have you. And we also extend a very warm welcome to Ms. Shashini Gregory, Visualization Analyst of Octave. Thank you for joining with us, ma'am. Thank you, pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure, it's our pleasure, ma'am. So uh, before we commence uh, with Masterclass 2.0, I would like to remind all of our team members here today to please uh, un uh, mute yourselves during the session which uh, will help us conducting the session more successfully. So please uh, take this time to mute yourselves and uh, remain muted. So um, also uh, a small reminder to our finalists once again that this will be the chance to allay your doubts before the final round of DataStorm 2.0. So grab this opportunity and do not hesitate to direct your questions to us as the session will be conducted as a panel discussion. And when we are directing the question, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions, or you could always um, use the chat box below and I will direct your questions to our panelists. Thank you very much. And now I will be handing over the session to our speakers. Over to you, sir. Thanks, thanks, Dimini. Yes. Good evening, everyone. It's good to see a couple of familiar faces from the Data Storm 1.0. Oh, sorry, from Masterclass 1.0. So uh, congratulations, first of all, uh, for everyone. Uh, to, you know, to crack the first use case and then uh, ready to crack the second use case as well. So just before uh, I, mean, I jump to today's presentation uh, or maybe the sessions, I just wanted to hear from you, like uh, how was the case study one? Did you had any difficulties? So were you happy with uh, what you have done? Or did you had any difficulties? So I'll take a couple of minutes if you, if you need any, any clarification.
Yeah, the final pitch is on 28th, yes. So the Viva presentation is going to be on 28th, yes. 27th, you, uh, you will have 12 hours to crack the problem. Uh, so, uh, yeah, go ahead. So, so uh, after the final case study, uh, on that day itself, do we have the Viva presentation or? So uh, the, you will have uh, 12 hours on 27th, that will be on Saturday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to solve the problem. So then the Viva will start on 28th at 10 o'clock. Then so you have quite a time to prepare your Viva presentation uh, and also the records. So you, you have some time. Uh, so, then, uh, yes. so, so all of the 15 should participate in the Viva presentation? Oh, yes. final five. All the 15. Ah, all the 15. Yeah, so, so you if... have the opportunity to, you know, uh, in, in the morning session, you'll have the opportunity to, you know, present your, present oh, okay. your, your, your case study and how did you solve that uh, problem for uh, six oh, charges. Oh. So from that, they will select a uh, top five where they will going to compete on um, each other in the evening. So those uh, five will also have to prepare a final pitch, no? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. okay so. Any, anything else? So, uh, how was the first use case? Was it I difficult? Or? Yes, I have one uh, like clarification because last time uh, when you can consider the first uh, case study, it was like we got like really low F1 scores and uh, uh, there is like a lot of class imbalance. I assume like that is the reality of the real world problems, but uh, how the reliability and the trust of these models uh, in that, uh, when applying for the real world scenarios. Since yeah, so that, that's, that's the reality of the, the use cases. So I mean like, uh, so I just wanted to give you a real use case with the real uh, data. So you can understand what type of problems that you are going to you know, solve in real world. And also you are not going to get a balanced data as well. So I have made it a little bit uh, difficulty for you to you know, look into uh, how to crack unbalanced data set too. But in, in terms of the reality uh, in, in real use cases, so like uh, accuracy is it's only a one, one data point that you are going to take some decisions. So there are other, other factors like you know, the time and the cost. And so there'll be quite a bit of factors will come to play to take the, the final decision. So accuracy, yes, you do, you do need like, you know, a little bit of high accuracy models too. So if you don't have like high, high accuracy models, you can do uh, quite a bit of feature engineering uh, things too. Uh, see like, you know, the, you can improve uh, the accuracy into at least into up, up to one level. But uh, in, in reality, so it's, it's an iterative process. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the masterclass 1.0, it's, it's, it's an iterative process. So yeah, you come up with a one version, so you talk with the business units and see like the, this, this is the model and based on X number of data and you start to keep, keep iterating. You know? So until um, it's an iterative process. That, that's how it's working in, in, in real world. So accuracy is it's only a one, one data point that you take conditions. So you're not going to get like very uh, you know, balanced data or very clear data. So in that particular problem, you didn't have any any data cleaning uh, uh, work too. So the, uh, I have made it a little bit clear, clean, clean data set for you guys to work on. Uh, but in, in reality, uh, that's not the case as well. So can we expect uh, same type of data set in the second uh, final case study also? Yeah, there's a possibility that you can get it or it, the problem might be a little bit complicated as well. So you are going to get like a little bit higher level uh, business case. Oh, okay, sir. Okay. So, so the, the idea in here is uh, as Octave, we don't need to, you know, we don't want to like provide you like in a similar type of academic level type of questions where you, you I, I believe you, you are pretty much good on those things, you know. Just wanted to provide you like a, something that a real world use case. So uh, you can see sometimes even the, the target variable, it's not clear to you too. So you might have to define those variables as well. That's how the real world scenarios work on. So someone is not going to tell you, okay, this is the, the target variable, for example. 
or you might have to work doing unsupervised type of learning um, algorithms as well. So you might have to uh, work a little bit harder to you know, understand this, this type of uh, uh, target variables and also spend quite a bit of time on understanding each, each particular column too. You know, what, what is this particular column is going to be? And also uh, do a little bit of research and the background of, about the problem as well you know, before you start to crack it. Um, uh, I have one question. Like, uh, do we have to uh, identify the variables? That means, like, label and or something like that. Or so the data dictionary, we will give it to you. Okay, so the, the data dictionary will have yeah. uh, identified the label as a column, right? Or else, do we have to create the label? No. So the data dictionary will provide you like what is this particular column means and what what is it. Okay. Thank you. There will be data dictionary. So once you get the data, make sure you go through the data data dictionary. Right? Um, so Tiraj, you, you want to add anything here? Excuse me, sir. No, I think you covered uh, pretty much. Well, sir, excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, you told no the uh, do a uh, background study. I mean research. Mm -hmm. uh, is it okay if we can uh, we can find research papers which are similar to this and uh, have an idea about the about your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's totally up to you. Yes. Okay. That's how you're okay. going to solve the problem. So this, this is pretty open. Like it's you know yeah. So once you get the problem, you know don't start to crack it. Like just under, spends quite a bit of time to understand the problem and see if anything else has done it. So this is an open, 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 open hackathon. So I just wanted to spend how to solve the problem. Yes, that, that's, that's totally fine. And on, on the, the beauty of data science problems is every problem is unique. You know? So the concepts might be sim, you know, similar, but the problem that you're going to solve, the real problem is going to be very unique from, uh, from problem to problem, or even for the business case to business case or even for the business units to business unit. So you might work with like a very similar type of problems in different uh, business domains, but uh, the uniqueness of that particular problem is very, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretty much unique for that particular business domain. So it's, it's, it's always good you spend some time to understand, uh, understand the business domain. So once you get the problem, so it will uh, provide you like, uh, what, is, what is the problem and what is the domain is. So spend some time to understand uh, uh, domain uh, and I think we have provided you quite a bit of information for you to you know um, uh, start and also we are going to provide you some information in this presentation as well so uh, we have a one more day too uh, so it might help you to you know, at least uh, to do some little bit of research on, on the on the domain as well so we are we are going to provide you the domain but not the question uh, so you have some time to at least do some study about understanding the domain. Will we have the data set uh, before the event or like without the column or without no, you the don't. column? Uh, no, you don't. You, you will only get the data set on, on Saturday. Okay, thank you. So you, you are going to crack the real world use case. Uh, the data we provide with the, with the use case. So I might try to attempt those the, the questions, you know, especially it, it will uh, show you how, how to crack a data science problem you know? um, in, a, in, a re, in a real world. So as I mentioned like several times in data science field, uh, we need quite a bit of people from other domains as well. Like the data engineers, we need visualization experts, we need delivery reads, we need business analytics, data analytics. There's a lot of people involved to, you know, uh, solve one, um, business problem using data analytics, sorry, using analytics. So data scientists, is a, it's only a one part, uh, but hopefully this problem will allow you to you know, show different, different things. And also think about out of the box too, uh, especially in the visualization, how you want to represent the, the data or how you want to represent your findings to the top managements and how you can do those things. So th those things will uh, carry some marks as well. And all these interventions, uh, will be the, the will be the interesting things, yeah. especially if you are trying to follow solve like a cash flow problem. 
and also spend quite a bit of time on the explorator data analytics as well. So I saw some reports, some guys have spent some time, but some of them not. Uh, but uh, I gave you quite a bit of information on how to uh, do exploratory data analytics. And uh, uh, the pre previous uh, session, um, Asanka and Dinusha also, they provide quite a bit of guidelines for you to do, like different hints sector. They were providing little, little, some hints uh, that might easily, you know, crack these type of uh, data science problems and what type of expert or data analytics you need to do. I think we gave quite a bit of information about the data types as well, how to do the data transformation and also some guidelines for do the transformations as well. So at least use, use these uh, tips, you know, that might help you for in, in a future too. So the, uh, I hope uh, it, it actually help you guys quite a bit to you know, solve that problem. Um, so those guidelines that they have put together I hope it helped you too. Any, any other questions? Imesh, are you good? Hello? I guess he dropped, I guess. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, so then if yes, there's yes. no questions, we'll jump into the today's sessions. Yes, so of me, course. Yeah. We will uh, yeah, commence with the presentation. There is no And uh, Tenuko and uh, Dushan, do you have anything else they wanted to, uh, you wanted to inform them about the, why the dates? Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Rajat, uh, Devani will uh, brief uh, on how the finals yeah. will happen uh, after the session. Uh, okay, cool. Okay, so then let, uh, let me take the session today. Yes, you. Uh, Dumini, let me share my screen, so. Yes, of course. Uh, let me know if, if you can see my screen. We can see, see your screen, sir. Okay, so, so let's start. Um, so let, uh, let me introduce uh, some of my colleagues today um, for these sessions. So we have uh, Shashini Gregory. So Shashini is a visual, data visualization expert at Octave. So she has been with the London Stock Exchange for uh, three, maybe three to four years. and. She, um, she has working with uh, Octave and she's the head of uh, data visualization team at Octave. And also we have uh, Tiraj. Uh, so he's working as a data scientist at Octave. So he, he has uh, been in the union uh, as a data scientist in Union Assurance and also with Octave. And he has done his studies uh, in UTS in Sydney, in Australia, and, uh, and myself. So, so these are the, the people uh, going to uh, conduct today's sessions. So the session is uh, ha, session is uh, consists of three parts. So the first one is you are going to introduce the domain that you are going to solve the problem. So that will give you quite a bit of information, like what is the domain that you are going to you know, solve the problem. Apparently. And also we will provide some details about and some of the key key terms uh, too. So note down those key terms, and if you have any questions, do ask uh, during that session. It is the opportunity for you to talk. You know? So I will, I would prefer if you can talk and ask this stuff. And then um, we'll have a, a small session about the data visualization and why it is important. And I also want to see like you spend quite a bit of time about the visualization techniques as well uh, during the case study. And then uh, at the end, uh, we'll briefly, very briefly, I, I will outline like uh, some tips to create slides and also how to you know, uh, finalize your, your viva presentation as well. Okay, so, so the question that you are going to solve is, it's in the insurance domain. So you know, to provide quite a bit of information, let me introduce my uh, uh, colleague, uh, Tiraj. So he will give you a very good information about uh, insurance domain. He's an expert uh, uh, data scientist uh, working in insurance. So you can get quite a bit of information around with him and please do ask any questions if you have. So this is the opportunity for you to ask questions, okay? 
Okay, over to you, Tiraj. Thank you, Rajda. So, good evening, all. Uh, hope you guys had a good week so far. All uh, right. So, let's talk about uh, life insurance, right? So, before we get to uh, life insurance, um, I'm pretty sure all of you must have heard the word insurance by itself, right? Um, so, let's let's look let's look at an example of what uh, I meant by insurance, right? So. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you are aware of, you know, car insurance, right? So whenever you buy a, a car, you're supposed to get an insurance, right? It's actually compulsory. You know? So what does that insurance mean? Right? What, what does it give you, right? So it's, it's basically saying, okay, I'm going to pay you, pay the company, the insurance company, uh, uh, a monthly fee or something, but I, for, for a given particular period. And I, I want to be, I want to make sure that if something does happen to the car, that the company will cover it. Right. So, so in terms of like a direct definition of what insurance is, is basically, you know, you're having a contract between yourself and an insurance company saying that, uh, uh, please do cover me for a certain period of time. Uh, and I'll be paying you a monthly amount of uh, X monthly X amount until 20 years or 30 years or whatnot. Right. And in case something does happen to your car or vehicle, the insurance company will cover it. Yeah, they will. Right? So they will have that is, hello. Yeah. So that is technically uh, what insurance would mean, right? Now, if you apply the same concept, like use the same concept as a onto a life insurance, uh, you're basically saying, okay, uh, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna have a contract between myself and the insurance company, and I want the insurance company to guarantee me. That they will cover me in any uh, in an un unconditional death or uh, if I'm hospitalized, and they will you know have a financial security. They'll provide you a financial security to either you or nominees you provide. Right. So what that means is the company actually protects your life. If something happens to you, uh, let's say in an event of a death, the money you have paid them so far. They will obviously, you know, based on certain ratios, they'll have a they'll have a certain amount of coverage that you decide when you initially start your uh, insurance policy, and then that amount will be given back to you or the people you nominate. Right. So that is like the, the high level of what insurance is and how it applies to life insurance. Right. Um, so there are there are many different uh, terminologies we use in uh, insurance. Um, there's, uh, there's actually quite a lot, right? But the most common ones are what we're gonna go through right now. So you know, these these terminals are really good for you to keep in mind when you know you're when you're prepping the case on Saturday, right? Uh, because I'm pretty sure you're gonna uh, you know face a lot of uh, actually almost all of these uh, terms when you're prepping the case on Saturday. Uh, okay. So now let me just uh, you know take you guys through the process of uh, what happens in insurance, right? So I'm pretty sure maybe most of you, at least some of you would be, uh, would have actually met an insurance advisor or maybe an insurance advisor would have come to you in, term, in you know, looking for a, a insurance sale, right? What happens then is, um, so these advisors advise you on your insurance. They, they sort of provide you information of how insurance should happen, what is insurance, why you should get insured and all these things, right? Uh, let's say you are interested in uh, having a life insurance. So the first thing, what happens? is the advisors, uh, so the people who, you know, go and work on the field and go and actually sell these uh, insurance uh, policies are called advisors or agents, right? So if an agent appro approaches you, right, and if you're interested, what the agent will do is they'll provide you with a quotation, right? So a, quote, a quotation is, you know, saying, okay, um, I want, uh, you know, this type of an insurance, uh, for this, uh, for like X amount of years with, you know, a monthly payment of this much and so on. Right? It's, it's just a really rough document. They don't even take your details or anything. Maybe, you know, just like phone number just to get in touch with you, right? So that is, that's, that's a quotation. Okay. And obviously agents can give you multiple quotations, right? And let's say you are interested in one of those quotations and you say, okay, you know what? I think I like this quotation and uh, let's go ahead with this. Right. The next step of that is the agent or the advisor will 
provide you with a proposal. So, so the proposal is actually a second step of the quotation, whereas it, it has your actual details. They gather your actual details, they gather your, you know, your the, the, the time you actually want to have insurance or how much you want to pay for your insurance and, you know, all the solid information, right? And once that is also okay, what they do, then what they do is then they, they pass it on to the uh, insurance company and then the insurance company uh, does a few checks on, you know, in terms of medical checks and all that, and then they convert it into a policy, right? So what you get in return is a policy. Okay, so policy is basically the final uh, document, you know, the contract between yourself and the company, right? If you can, if you see the point number three in the slide, that is what policy is. Right? So that's the final document of the contract between yourself and the company, right? Cool. Next, we have, uh, if you look at what enforced and lapsed, right? The points number one and point number two. Um, what enforced means is basically, uh, it's, it's sort of a second word for active, okay? We say the policy is enforced. What that means is, okay, your, your policy, your current life insurance policy is in an active state, right? That means you have been paying all your premiums. Okay, that's another term I will explain later. You have been paying your premiums on time and your policy is up to date and it's currently active, All right? Then let's say, okay, in case you missed your premiums and you forgot to pay or you couldn't pay for a certain amount of time, let's say one month or two months, you missed your payments, your policy automatically becomes lapsed, right? Point number two. What, what this means is, okay, your policy is inactive due to non-payment. You haven't paid, so we have lapsed your policy. That means when you're, when you're in a lapsed state and if something does happen to you, you can't claim your insurance, right? So you will always, you, you, you should you make sure that it's always enforced. Now, I've been talking about this premium word a lot, right? So what, what, is, the, what is premium, right? So that is one very important word that you all have to keep in mind. So, uh, you know, the direct definition of premium is uh, what you see here, right? It's a periodic payment you make to your insurance company to keep your policy active or keep your policy enforced, right? So in the, in the current scenario of uh, the insurance domain of uh, what we are going to be working on Saturday, there are several um, ways or payment modes or methods, right? I would say payment modes uh, involved which is monthly, quarterly, half yearly, annually. And there's another one called single, right? Uh, what this means is basically the, the, the time period or how like the, the periodic uh, payment method, right? So if you say, okay, you're a, you have a monthly policy, that means you are paying your premiums every month, right? If you're a, if you, if you say quarterly policy, it means you're paying your premiums every quarter and half yearly twice a year and annually once a year, right? And which is whatever is not mentioned here is a single payment, right? So what single payment means is, okay, you have a policy, you paid only once. So you pay the entire amount of your coverage once and that's it. And your policy is gonna be active till uh, whenever you have, a, uh, till whenever you have paid the last day. Yeah? So do we have any questions on uh, these five uh, or whatever we discussed for so far? Oh, is it all clear? Yes, sir. Awesome. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, a few more terminologies used in life insurance, right? And um, uh, the important one, well, I would say the, another common one, just like premium is something called sum assured. Okay, so this sum assured, it refers to a pre-decided amount payable to the policy holder or beneficiary on the occurrence of an insured event. Okay, so what that means is, okay, when you're signing your initial policy, right, the contract between yourself and a company, you're gonna decide, okay, this is the amount of uh, premiums I'm gonna pay either monthly or quarterly or uh, annually or whatever. And you're gonna decide on how much you're going to get back or how much you're being covered, okay? That is something, uh, not you don't decide directly, but it's something that is, been calculated from the insurance company based on how much you're paying your premium. Okay, and till what extent and which periodic method, 
right? At a monthly uh, half yearly or, or so on. Okay. So this sum I should, in a nutshell or in an example, I'll tell you what what this is. Let's just say, okay, your month, your you you have a policy. Uh, you're paying a policy at a monthly level, and every month you're paying five thousand rupees. Okay. Based on that, and let's just say you're going to pay for you you want the coverage of your insurance to be ten years. Okay. Based on that. Your coverage and your premium and certain obviously other factors, the company will say, okay, for those ten years, this is the sum I should we are going to give. Okay, let's just say one million rupees. Okay, what happens is in case within those ten years something does happen to you, that one million rupees will be either given to you uh, based on uh, you know what the the incident that happens, or in case of your death, it will be given to whoever you have nominated. Right, so that one million amount is the sum assured amount. Right, next thing is uh, something called a rider. Okay, so uh, what this what a what a rider means is uh, you know it's the simplest way to say what a rider is. It's just it's just an additional uh, sort of additional feature or additional product you want with your policy. Right, so the definition over here you see is it's an add-on coverage to your life insurance policy that provides additional benefits or exclusion. Right. As an example, obviously, let's just say you have a policy, uh, like a educational policy. Right. That is your product. You you have an educational policy. Uh, down the line, you see, you, you think, okay, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's good to sort of have a medical coverage as well. Right. And then you can add these certain riders, which actually covers your medical uh, coverage. Right. So it's sort of a, like an add-on, right? So it's like okay, if you buy your iPhone, I you know you want to add add an uh, uh, headset to it or something like that. It's just an uh, add-on coverage, right? So these riders, there are there are lots of lots of riders, right? It it depends on what you want, but this in in a in an actual business, there are there are heaps and lots of riders uh, you can add on, okay? Uh, are we clear with the rider part? Yeah, that's uh, that's. Do you have any questions? So is it uh, like a extra option? Exactly, it is like an extra option. Okay. Right. Uh, that, uh, yeah, keep 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 the rider part in mind, okay? Because you it might be uh, very useful when it comes to the uh, case study on salary. Um, now there there are some other terms, right? So we we did discuss about enforced and lapsed, right? Enforced is when your policy is active. Lapsed is when you you have missed a payment and your your policy is inactive. Now this just other... can I ask a question? Yep. Yeah. So so uh, can we add the riders at any time? So for their benefits. Yes, you can add a rider at any time. So just as we discussed on enforced and lapsed, there are two other sort of uh, statuses, I would say, right? So if you look at a policy status, you will see enforced or lapsed or surrendered or terminated, right? So we talked about enforced and uh, lapsed. So now you will see the two words, uh, the last one and the third one, surrendered and terminated. Now, if you do read this definition correctly, um, you will think, oh, what's the difference? It's the same thing, right? Because surrender says a full cancellation of your insurance policy. Terminated says the policy can no longer be active. And you will you'll wonder why it's, you know, why you're saying that it's two different things, the same thing. Uh, it's actually two different things. Uh, the reason uh, what we mean by surrender is the customer is willingly stopping the policy, right? So the customer says, okay, look, uh, I don't want to pay this anymore. I can't pay this anymore due to some reason. I want to stop this. So the customer surrenders, and then we put the policy as a surrendered policy. What terminated means is uh, it can mean uh, two things. Okay, if the policy is matured. Now, what does matured mean? Right. So okay, let's say you have a policy. You are you want the coverage for ten years. Okay. So for you know, you have you pay your policy. It's been active. It's been enforced, and you have done your payments for ten years. So after ten years, your policy is finished, right? You you have gone that ten years. You have paid that ten years. It's all good, and it's finished. 
uh, the moment it's finished, we say it's a matured policy, right? So you, that means uh, you have gone according to the plan, uh, the coverage is complete and you are matured. So that, that's a matured. So when it's a matured policy, the status of that policy will also be uh, shown as terminated. Okay. The other reason how it can be terminated is when your policy is lapsed, okay, after a certain amount of time, if the customer does not pay, we say, okay, you know, the customer is not going to pay, it's not going to come back. So we are going to terminate that policy, right? Because it's no point keeping a policy for a customer who's not going to be paying. Okay. But remember, it's after a certain period of time of being lapsed. Okay. Not directly after lapse is going to be terminated. No, it has to be lapsed for a certain amount of time. And after that, we'll consider it as terminated. Also, oh, if it is terminated, uh, there is no use in that policy, no, sir? After exactly. that? Exactly. No okay. use. So, right. the is, uh, same applies for the surrender also? Same applies for surrender. Okay. Because the difference is the customer is willingly doing it. The other one is the customer is unintentionally doing it. Uh, so, is there a payment we have to do uh, if we have to terminate to surrender? Like, after a certain amount of time, they have maybe paid enough? Uh, or they have like they have uh, anyway they have paid some amount of money so do we have to return a certain amount or like we just keep the whole amount as they have paid no so if the if the customer has a terminated policy the company will still keep the amount because it's a it's a contract right so you have given a contract saying okay i am going to pay this amount monthly till this amount of time and you haven't paid it after a certain amount of time. So therefore that money obviously cannot be returned to the customer. It will be in within the, with the company. Right. Is that clear? Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Right. Uh, and one last word uh, or, or you know, important term is, uh, the word actually is term. Uh, what I mean by term is uh, the defined period of coverage, right? So I think uh, we, dis we you know, discussed that, you know, saying, okay, when you are giving a policy or when you're having a policy, uh, initially, when you decide on your policy, how long you want your coverage for, right? It can be five years, 10 years, 15, 25, it all depends on you, right? So that, those, that the, the period of coverage, the, the word we use for that is term, okay? Cool. Um, yeah, Rajita, maybe we can go to the next slide, right? So now we want to talk about, you know, what is cross-sell and upsell. Okay. Um, this is a this is a good slide uh, for you all to listen up to because, uh, you know, you can get a good idea of what actually cross-sell is and what upsell means. Right. So upsell is uh, uh, if you define it in terms of, you know, like a direct definition, you would say upsell is a process of you know upgrading the customer's current item or to purchase a better item than the current item, right? So I think the, I think the picture over here actually, you know, gives the entire picture of what upsell and cross-sell means, right? So upsell is, uh, you know, okay, you have your, you know, old Nokia 6600 phone, right? And you want to upgrade it to, you know, iPhone. So that is an upsell. You are just upgrading whatever you have to something better, okay? Now, what's the difference between upsell and cross-sell? So cross-sell is actually the process of providing additional items to go with your current item, right? Okay, let's say you have an iPhone. Okay, okay, so you have an iPhone. Now, what about, you know, adding a headset to it? Uh, what about adding uh, Bluetooth uh, speakers or something like that, right? So these are additional products that go with your current item, right? So upsell is upgrading your current item to something better Cross-sell is adding a different item to whatever you have already. Uh, are, we, are we clear with the two definitions? Uh, so is it like uh, adding a rider, right? Um, okay, uh, good question. Uh, adding a rider, what, what do you think? Would it be upsell or would it be cross-sell? It should cross be cross-sell. It should be? Cross-sell. Cross okay, that is, where, uh, that is where I will slightly change your definition, okay? Now, let's talk in terms of uh, policies or insurance that will make it easy. So if you have a policy already, right? So like I said, additional uh, riders are additional coverages, okay? You already have a policy. And if you're adding a rider, that is something you, you know, 
it's like, it's like a upgrade you you want to you have your existing product but you want to upgrade your product to cover something else right so if you are if you are having your existing product and if you want to cover something else that would fall under upsell right even though it's an additional coverage or uh, you know how we define it as an additional coverage we are still adding it to the existing product like we are upgrading it to the existing like we are upgrading the existing product oh sir excuse me sir yeah uh, so after adding the additional coverage does it override the uh, uh, initial coverage yes Uh, uh -huh. by overriding i would say so you have your premiums uh, your existing premium right you pay your existing premium when you add yes. that additional coverage or when you upgrade it you mm. have to you know uh, your your existing policy will upgrade and you will have to pay an extra premium right so okay. it will it will be on top of what you had earlier uh, okay that's a, that's a, yeah, literally upgrade no sir that is literally an upgrade uh, yes. okay sir In could terms you, of uh, yeah, go ahead. I, could you please give us an example from insurance industry for a, a cross sell? Sure. Uh, so let's say you have a policy, right? Uh, let's say you bought a policy uh, uh, for an educational uh, policy, right? And now you want you say, okay, you know what? Uh, maybe I would like to think of you know having a, a, a investment policy, right? So you have your existing. Uh, uh medical uh sorry education or medical policy for the current year or the previous year and you're saying okay i want to have a second policy of an investment uh, policy or something of a different product so what what you are going to be having you know once you get your second policy is two two policy so these are two different items by right? two different product do i make myself clear i mean is that understandable so let's say you okay given a certain amount of time you have one product at right? one policy after a certain amount of time you say okay you know what i want to have a uh, investment product and then you buy another investment product on top, like you have one already you're buying something else again another product okay so that means after some time you're going to have two products So when you look at the first product, the first product when you had when you had your first product, and now when you have your second product, we can say it's a cross sell because you have successfully bought a second product in the same company. Is that yeah. is that clear? Yeah, it is clear. So, so we have okay. Now we have a clear example for this. Sir, can you like uh, differentiate that with the upsell? Okay. Yeah. So uh, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, let's take the uh, riders right for upsell what happens is you have an uh, you have a single product right you want to add and uh, you know additional coverage or upgrade your existing product with an additional coverage right so after let's say you start you started with a single product with no additional coverage right after a couple of months you add or upgrade your existing policy or product with additional coverage so that is upselling right you have upgraded it you only, but see the difference is you still have only one policy but when it comes to cross sell you have two policies your one becomes two in cross sell in upsell your one still becomes upsell uh, one right it remains as one policy okay thank you now it's clear awesome Um, cool. I think uh, that is it. So, if anyone has questions, uh, now is a good time. We can discuss regarding insurance or uh, anything else. Raja, maybe you can a uh, little bit dis uh, discuss uh, anything about uh, downsell. Is there a concept called downsell in insurance? Uh, there's not a concept called downsell at the moment, but there is something called. I mean. we can consider a certain uh, aspect like downgrading your uh, policies or something right um the thing with downs i mean there is downs but with when it comes to insurance what we say or do is um, uh, if we do have a certain policy and uh, if we say we are paying 5000 a month with the premium of 5000 a month for a certain amount of years 
that is fixed right so we can't we can't go below 5000 we can always add more coverages and go above 5000 but we can't bring that 5000 to 4000 we can't say okay uh, after 2 3 years uh, okay uh, maybe i'm you know struggling financially can i can i just pay only 4000 a month that cannot be done right uh, in that case what we recommend to do or what insurance companies mostly do is they give another policy at that time when they have financial troubles with their premium changed to 5 uh, 4000 right it is sort of down sell but you can't consider it entirely down sell because it's a totally different product and the existing product which you had at 5000 a month will be cancelled okay thanks thanks yeah. so uh, guys hopefully uh, it's clear for everyone do you have any questions? So I think we, we discussed upsell, cross sales, and downgrade and downsells. Uh, do you have any questions for him before we move to the other, other session? Uh, so oh. I have one question. This is from the perspective of an insurance company. So it is better if people get downsell or they could uh, terminate or they could uh, surrender, right? So from the perspective of uh, uh, insurance company, so it is more profitable to the company than uh, providing the actual uh, amount or whatever, right? Uh, I wouldn't say it's more profitable. Uh, I would say it's a waste for the customer, right? The reason why I won't say it's profitable is because let's say you're a paying customer of 5,000 monthly for 10 years, and right? you're supposed to be paying for 10 years. And after five years, you stopped paying. So that means you either terminated or surrendered, right? Yes, for 5,000 till five years, times five years, we have that money within the company. But for the next five years, we don't have that money. We don't have the customer with us, right? So it's not entirely profitable just to, you know, have a policy given to a customer and then they surrender or they terminate. It was in terms of even in, in, a, in a perspective of an insurance company also, it's not profitable. The, the more you continue with your insurance company, the better it is for both parties. Okay, so always then when you are building the machine learning models also, we have to uh, think of uh, going better, like better, like a good relationship between both parties, like the variable should be uh, to uh, be better with both parties, right then? Um, ideally in most scenarios, yes. Um, I, I say most scenarios because it it always depends on the business problem, right? What you want to solve. Uh, but yes, ideally, what you want to see is a is a good relationship between the customer and the company. Okay, thank you. Yeah, awesome. So, do you have any more questions? Any other questions? So, th this is a good opportunity for you to clarify any, any questions. So, your question is going to be in insurance. Sir, uh, is there any benefit for customer if they surrender uh, uh, over terminated? Is there a benefit for customer if they surrender or terminated, right? Is that the question? Yeah. Uh, no, not uh, really, right? So let's uh, say you, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sir, I mean, uh, uh, why do uh, people surrender if they can terminate? Yeah, so I think uh, I'll explain the definitions again, right? So what I meant by terminated is, uh, yeah, there you go. So a policy is no longer active, right? So there are two ways on how a policy can be terminated, right? One is over over matured. That is fine. So if you are saying what 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 I mean by matured is the the customer has paid their entire. If, for example, if they say for 10 years, they have paid their entire 10 years and it's complete, it's matured, right? The, the, the terminology you will get or you will find in insurance data is that there will be something called terminated, not matured, right? The, the reason for being terminated can either be matured or terminated, right? Now, if you take the reason for the policy to be terminated is because the customer hasn't paid 
for a certain amount of time. But if you look at the reason for termination as matured, that means the customer has completed his uh, coverage of policy, right? So if you are like, if your question is saying, okay, is it is it benefit for the customer to surrender or mature? Then the answer would be mature. Yes, it is very benefit. It's going to be benefited for the customer if they have a mature policy. If they mature their policy, right? Not surrendered or terminated. Did you did you understand the difference? I mean, sir, uh, if uh, if let's say when a customer they don't have money to pay, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, literally uh, he can uh, wait for terminated or they can mm -hmm. surrender. Correct. Yeah. Then why do they choose if someone choose to surrender? Is there benefit? From no, there. There is no distinct benefit like that. I, it, the both the both scenarios would be uh, the same uh, outcome. Like there's no benefit for the customer. Uh, okay, sir. It's like saying, okay, uh, you know, you have a coverage of you have policy coverage for ten years. After five years, you say, I don't want to pay, and then you go to the company and say, I don't want to pay this, and then that is your surrender. That means you're willingly stopping your policy. Right? You want to stop your policy, right? Huh? Uh, yeah, when it comes to terminated, that means you you might, you might have forgotten to pay, and you know you have just let the policy go without being without doing any payments, and it has automatically just gone to lapse, and then it has terminated. Right. So either way, the outcome is the same. Like there is no benefit. So if, uh, yeah, I have one question. Like if we can identify. Surrender, surrender, and terminate, uh, terminating people earlier. What what are the precautions usually uh, 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 insurance company used to take, or do they like to uh, like uh, not involve those kind of people in their insurance policies, or uh, are they going to uh, go with lower uh, policy or something like that? Is there anything like that? Uh, good question. That again, I would say it depends on the company. But to give you a high level view of you know how things work, it's uh, it's good for the company to actually identify this set of customer, right? The reason I say that is because once they once they can identify these customers, they can you know uh, you know maybe provide uh, you know a better way of you know payments or either installments. That that all depends on the company. But as an example, they may, may maybe you know if they have a financial problem, what they can do is they can you know say okay, we'll we'll give you an installment uh, phase or something, or we'll we'll look after you, or we'll we'll give you an extended period of time for to make your payments. So these are all business calls that totally depend on the uh, insurance company, right? But yes, for your question, it's good to identify these set of customers so that we can actually you know take a precautionary step. Before they surrender or get terminated. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, now in the perspective, in the point of view of the customer, surrender and terminate uh, both have the same effect on he, him, customer. Uh, Correct. But uh, but uh, on the perspective of the company, do both have the same effect on the company or surrender? Because surrender is a. a uh, thing done by the customer with willing, right? Right. So, so it still does have the same uh, effect on the company, right? So if a customer comes to the company and says, I want to stop paying, um, let's say as an example, for 10 years, you, you have uh, uh, agreed to pay for 10 years and after five years, you go to the company and say, I want to stop paying, right? So in that scenario, the company will not get the money for the next five years of that customer, right? Uh, similarly, of, yeah. In terms of the reputation and the uh, impact of the company on the society, would wouldn't it uh, affect that surrender principle? Um, I mean, so in terms of uh, reputation and. Uh, that it solely depends on the people who actually, or the customer, right? Because I mean, if the customer 
goes and spreads the bad word around the company, yes, then it will affect the company. But in terms of you know surrender or terminated, like given the scenario in the industry, it, it doesn't uh, you know have a big impact in terms of reputation, right? It doesn't have a big impact like that. These things are sort of uh, actually normal. You would like you wouldn't even believe these are actually normal scenarios that actually happen in insurance companies. Awesome. Cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, if there's no further questions, we can uh, move to the next uh, part. Uh, another Thanks, Thanks Dad. Yeah, for the, uh, just need to be a little bit concerned about the time myself. But yeah, yeah th thank you so much, Tiraj. I think yeah, it was a you. quite a bit of uh, informative session, actually. Um, it's good to see that you guys are you know, interactive with, with the session. And hope uh, uh, it helped you to at least to understand a little bit of about insurance and then you have some time to, you know, to do a little bit of research on this area tomorrow as well. And if you have, do have any questions, uh, send me an email. So I'm happy to answer to, uh, your questions as well. Okay, uh, so you can get my email address from, uh, from uh, what rec people, so they have my email address. So I'm um, happy to uh, connect with you and uh, provide you any, any information. Okay, so let, let's move on to the second session. So, so we also wanted to highlight a couple of more interesting things, uh, especially in the visualization. As a data, data scientist, this is one area that you, are, you also need to heavily work on in, in, a, in a real world uh, uh, use case. So let me introduce uh, uh, my colleague, so Shashini. So she's the head of data visualization team at Octim. So she will very briefly, uh, you know, providing some useful information for everyone about data visualization and especially uh, highlighting what, what is the benefits. So uh, make sure you have the uh, uh, interactive session as well. Um, so this will be really useful for how to you know, present your findings. Okay. Uh, Shashini, it's, it's over to you. Thanks, Rajita. Uh, hi, all. Uh, very good evening. Uh, so I will briefly talk about data visualization here. So it is the representation, uh, the graphical representation of your findings or the information that you have, where it, uh, it will uh, use to gain uh, insights uh, for, uh, that will be the purpose of uh, data visualization where you will have uh, insights on, on the data that you have gathered. So there are many benefits uh, when it comes to data visualization. So I have highlighted three here, where the main benefit of uh, this is to have a good method of uh, decision making. So data visualization helps in decision making by showing different trends over time, as well as different patterns in the data. So uh, when it comes to uh, visualizing your findings, you should make sure to have it visualized in a proper way in order to tell your story. If your story is not re represented in your final visualization, then the, the purpose of data visualization will not be there. So for that, there are three uh, best practices and the first one is you should know your audience. You should know whom you are presenting your findings. So in order to that, you have to uh, summarize your data and present the data accordingly. And secondly, you have to decide on the visual that is best for your representation. For example, if you want to uh, show a trend, you can't uh, use a pie chart. It should be either a bar chart or a line chart. And then finally, uh, you have, once the visualization is done, it should represent your story and then uh, it is good to go. Uh, so there's an example of uh, two different charts. So you can see in the top chart that the use of color and then in the bottom. So the difference between these two representation it can be, it's easily visible. So when it comes to colors also, it, you have to make sure that you are using the colors properly because our eyes are drawn to colors and pattern. So suppose you have red and blue, 
uh, written in words but using the same colors so initially you will see, you will know red is red using the color without reading it so the representation of the color should be there according to uh, your story uh, so that is uh, the basic idea about how you visualize your data so any question that you want to ask Okay, so, so I just wanted to uh, give you one, one hint for you guys. So when you, when you want to do the visualization, think, think about uh, in this way. So if you want to do the visualization, there are two parts. One is you are going to provide some information in a conceptual way. So the second one is this is the data-driven stuff. So uh, you know, do this histogram and uh, all this, you know, the uh, correlation matrix, this type of stuff, right? So when, when you wanted to present something, just, just uh, answer this question. Am I declaring something? Okay, you, you are, whether you are declaring something or exploring something, whether you want to do some exploration, right? So specific, specific, especially uh, the work that you guys have done in the EDE, in the first use case. So in this particular use case also, there'll be a lot of EDA, EDA work too. So think about it in, the, in that way too. Okay. So that might help you to uh, understand uh, what type of uh, visualization you want to do. So I'll also like give a little bit of information about uh, creating uh, presentations as well, just a little bit. Uh, but do you have any, any, any questions? So the visualization whole area is, 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 a, is a vast area. So it's, it's difficult to you know, uh, provide you huge amount of information within a given time, but uh, these are like very, very simple informations that will help you to uh, think about how, to, how do you want to visualize the, the information that you have. Okay, and also like, especially when you start to visualize it, make sure that your axes are very visible too. Especially like, you know, in this particular example, like X axis, Y axis are, are very clearly defined. Okay, so in, in real, world, in real uh, world use cases, you cannot do that, okay? Yeah, it will be a, a, be a, a bad mark for you, for the team. Okay? So you need to spend quite a bit of time uh, um, you know, when you want to present this, this information. Uh, so just before, before we wind up, uh, so, uh, sorry, but before we go to the next, next session, we, we, do you have any, any, any questions? Otherwise we can move to the other sessions. No, sir. Okay, thanks. So, uh, um, so this is also just a continuation of a data visualization task. So I just, just wanted to give you a couple of uh, you know, guidelines uh, for the presentation and the YY and the slide decks. So this, uh, I would like you to you know, uh, work on your, your presentation in these this key areas. So one is so you start the problem uh, context, you know, what is the problem that you are going to, you are going to solve. And the background, so you can do a little bit of about the background of the problem, uh, and uh, you can identify the gaps. Okay, uh, if you wanted to, if you are really solving a problem, you want you can identify the gaps, and also you can also look into the state of the art as well. You know, what is the current situation? What is the current technology? Okay, so you need to spend some time to uh, provide this type of information too. So these analytics documents. You know, generally you provide it to the business units too. Okay, so this is very beneficial for the data science and the visualization department, and also for the business analytics and the delivery department as well. So there are like four or five departments are involving uh, when you creating this uh, analytics type of uh, presentation. So just think about that. Uh, this is your responsibility that you need to provide analytics analytical solution in a visual way. And then the third part is you heavily work on the methodology or the solution design. Yes, what, what, what type of a solution that you're going to um, use to solve that problem. Okay. So the fourth is, so you need to do experiments as well. So where you come up with the experimental protocols, how you define, um, for example, simple example, the training data, testing data. Uh, so what are the hyperparameters that you used? 
whether you have any exploited data analytics visualization, you need to edit this, this, uh, this particular section. So the fifth is, this is where the, the most important things are going to happen. This is the number five, the in intervention. So you, you solve a problem in, using the data. So let's say uh, you create some data modeling. So then you got some uh, X number of accuracies. So then so what? That's the problem that you are going to solve. So you need to come up with some actionable uh, interventions. Okay. So most of the, uh, the problems in, in real world. So uh, you need to come up with these actions. What is the next step that you are going to do? So you, you, you solve a problem using some data models and then you come up with accuracy and then, then you are not done. So you need to understand what, what is the next thing that you can do? What, what are the action plans you can do? Okay. And maybe for some use cases, maybe you might need some operational departments too. Okay. Maybe you might need some marketing departments too. So how you are going to communicate uh, your insights to those departments to take some actions. So there's a lot of things happening. So these you know, key insights, you will provide it to the, the, the business, talk, business people, right? So these are the key insights. So you uh, uh, heavily work on like what, what type of actions that you can uh, take from the, the use case that you saw, okay? So this is just wanted to like give a little bit of about uh, the presentation um, structure I, I would love to see. So that might help you to, you know, uh, at least structure your problem. Excuse me, sir? Yeah. So uh, experiments, uh, by saying experiments, what do you mean, sir? I mean, so, uh, so the, by you, saying experiments, yeah, by saying experiments, uh, what, what do you expect? Yeah, so, the, so here experiments, is, so you have the problem, right? So you have the main problem. So you can divide the main problem into subtask, okay? And you can solve each particular subtask in different, uh, different techniques. For example, in here, ex experiments means maybe you can solve this problem just using like descriptive analytics. So like very simple uh, statistical inferences type of thing. So all these analytics that you do, uh, like EDA type of things will come, come to you. And also if you're working on some different feature engineering uh, things, those things will come come on under here as well. Okay, so you have done some different different features, or uh, these type of things will come under here. So the modeling things that you are doing, so they will come on under here too. The, the hyperparameter trainings that you are doing, so those will come on under here too. So the methodologies, the solution design, they are pretty much like in higher level, right? So let's say for example, a very simple example, you wanted to create like a very shallow network. So the, the number of neurons, number of layers, those type of you know the the Solution architecture, the solution design will come under the methodology section. In the experimental protocol is pretty much like how you wanted to like you know, um, divide your your, uh, your data set. Maybe you can say okay, x number of data I will use to training, uh, or and the rest is for the testing. Or maybe I'm going to use some post-validation type of techniques, and I'm going to use let's say four uh, four post validation so i'm going to use four for training one for testing and you know this is this is the the, the protocol so those type of things so you need to have like, you need to describe those things uh, the techniques yeah the techniques yes. uh, to so uh, like to increase the accuracy yeah could yes uh, could be okay uh, okay could so. be one is maybe you wanted to reduce the time maybe there might be some model you can create, uh, for example, with let's say some neural networks, for example, very simple. So you can create a neural network model where you can get around like, you know, very high accuracy, around 95%, for example. But it will cost you two days for training, okay? There might be some model where uh, you can generate within like, you know, two hours, but with 60% of it. So now you have a decision point. What is the model you are going after? So now, when you take a decision, as I mentioned earlier, uh, accuracy is not the only only data point that you are going to take a decision. Now you have a time bound. Okay, so you, in, in this particular problem, you have twelve hours. Okay, so there's a time that you know. So what is the model that you can you know grab it that that uh, that particular time? Or there's a possibility that uh, if you want to train some neural network models, it might cost you a lot too. You might need like a good GPU. So that will 
you know, now cost you some some amount of money where you need to buy a computer. So the other, right? so th those type of decisions you need to take it. So in that case, uh, uh, are you recommending any uh, models for the final uh, case? Uh, no, I'm not recommending any 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 models. Uh, so think about the problem and then like think about okay. the, the data points and decide like uh, what type of models you want to do. So very simple example I can give it to you is uh, so most of the time, most of the time people go after this deep, deep neural networks model. Right? So if you look at the deep neural network models, so let me see uh, something. So if you look at this deep neural network models. So there are uh, one decision point. One is amount of data. So let's assume the x axis is the data. Okay. So, so this is the data. So the, the y axis is the performance. Okay. So most of these deep neural networks models heavily work if you have a very high amount of data. Okay. For example, so let's say the performance or whatever it is. So it might go up, so, something like that. So you need a huge amount of data to have like a very high performance. Okay. So if you have like a low amount of data, it, it's, it's not highly recommended you to go after this type of neural network models because this shallow type of models might work uh, in, the, in the low level. So this is just example. This is like you know, shallow type of uh, models, like you know, some standard uh, uh, machine learning model. They are uh, pretty much like, um, uh, outperform these deep neural networks models if the data is in, in a, like a low range. Okay. So this is just one simple technique that you can use. Just look at the data and then decide. Okay. Um, whether you want to go with like you know huge amount of uh, whether you have a huge amount of data or whether you have like less amount of data, and then whether you want to go after these deep neural network models or whether you want to go after like shallow type of models. Okay. This this is a very simple one. Simple uh, example that I can give it to you, and also just look at the, your resources as well. What type of resources you have? You know? um, what type of cost you have? What type of expertise you have? I mean, in 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 the real world uh, problems, uh, these are the, the, the decision making points uh, when you want to solve solve a problem. Okay. Uh, anything else? Also. Okay, so uh, also just wanted to give you a little bit of about it, information about the how to create the slides. So uh, Shashini gave some information about you know about the visualization, quite a bit of information about and why it is important. So. of the slides okay so that's where the eye is going to be visible okay and you you should add only one concept of one slide okay don't make it a little bit more too messy too okay don't put like you know huge amount of text to the uh, slide too it's very difficult to uh, understand for the audience okay and also this couple of practices uh, most of the time you use light text on dark background as uh, one of the, the practices that you know, in heavy visualization people are working on. So, but you know, for, the, for the time being, I'm, I'm not really looking after that, but you can use like a white background. Uh, but these are some of the tips. And also have only the key points, two or three key points. So it will be very straightforward for you to describe or discuss, right? Don't make it like too overloaded all the slides. Okay? And also use clear visible diagrams. As, as Shashini mentioned, she, she showed an example as well. So make sure it's, it's very clear, uh, including the tables and charts too. And when also when you want to show some plot or figure, so you make sure you, your x-axis, y-axis up, labeled clearly and it's, it's, it's visible. And also don't uh, have you know, too much of animations. So it, it's, it's, it's good to have animations, but if you overload it with uh, too much of animations, it's going to be very difficult for the audience. Okay. So, so you make sure that you know 
have like you know if you want you can have like a simple and very you know uh, easy type of uh, animations but don't make it too overloaded it's going to be very difficult for the audience to adjust to it okay uh, and also in terms of the font size so don't use very fancy type of uh, fonts so the recommended uh, font type is the area so just for example if you if you uh, uh, maybe if you go out just look at some of the um, this, uh, road signals just look at the road signals and look at the, their font so they use aerial font types especially when you are uh, driving in the highways just look at those font types okay this particular uh, you know excess is in x amount of kilometers and look at those those uh, uh, font size and also look at that background too there's a reason that they have put those uh, green black green background in the white color there's a reason to those things right so they are not like accident type of things so scientists have spent quite a bit of time to understand why these different colors need. so as uh, as vishashin mentioned visualization is a big big uh, big area so area, use area because that's the most uh, uh, high friendly uh, font type okay and also uh, keep the fonts a little bit larger too so it's it's easy to you know uh, understand also avoid uh, all capital letters as well so you know, go with uh, with the first letter capital and the rest is simple and also um, make sure you use the colors but make sure that it has some purpose as shashini mentioned in, in, in her slide you know, in here so you can use colors but there should be some purpose okay uh, so that it might be very easy to read or for the, the judges to understand what you are going to present okay so um, so th there's a bunch of more you know, uh, i can give it to you uh, but for the time being i think this is this is good enough for you to you know, uh, provide a good presentation and also provide a good viva for 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 your case study on sunday um yeah that's that's pretty much it from us do you have any questions yes sir so final question sir just to make yeah so last time sir we had the final case study and we had a viva session and only who were selected uh, for the final round had the pitch and the presentation so is it for like the... is it same like uh, same this time or i might uh, need tenuka to help with this question tenuka uh, dushan uh yes uh, it's the same kind of scenario this time as well but uh, this time it's virtual Mufi, yes, uh, am i clear uh, yeah does all the teams need to uh, create uh, presentations for sun uh, for sunday vibe uh yes uh, so the thing is like this uh, from 8 am to 8 pm we will have the uh, case scattering around uh, and after that like by by the end of uh, 8 pm uh, in 27 uh, you will have to submit the report as well uh, so that's a, a report uh, we will we will be using in the viva round so the judge panel will ask question from the competitors based on the report you submitted uh, and after 8 pm you will have the freedom to uh, Uh, make your pre own presentation uh, in the for night for night uh, so uh, like uh, the presentation slides like, like you will uh, have five to eight slides uh, in the inner presentation so that presentation will only be used if you are selected for the uh, second stage of the competition uh, that is for the pitching round uh but the why why is uh... for for everyone uh yes why why is for all the 15 uh, teams okay so, so it madam, will be based uh, on the report uh, not the presentation so it does mean that we have to submit a report also for the final case yes yes oh uh, okay okay so okay so you can go through the the structure that i sent it uh, that i discussed with you uh, to create a, like a nice report okay I think yeah. So and also, I gave some information about the outline and all those things in the previous session, uh, session as well. Uh, 
what type of context outline and stuff. And also make sure that it's small, uh, more visual too. Okay, the report's more visual and uh, and um, don't use like you know very fancy fancy type of fonts as well. Okay, are are you familiar with uh, like LaTeX? Anyone? So you can use LaTeX to write reports as well. Uh, if you are not familiar with LaTeX, you can use the word. LaTeX is a good tool uh, to create uh, reports. So there are some bunch of uh, uh, softwares that you can do, uh, you can use actually uh, to create uh, reports. Okay, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Do you have any questions for all of us uh, before we wind up and see you on Saturday? Will we be getting a detailed uh, outline of what uh, Tenuka just described about the evaluation? Yeah, you, you, you will get it, yes. Okay, thank you. So make sure that you, you, your report is, you know, consists of these uh, these six six uh, areas. And I believe that you may need to submit the link for your your code as well. So um, similar to the first round. GitHub, okay. GitHub, uh, link now? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, okay, sir. So one question, like, uh, when it comes to the evaluation of the Viva, is it based on the report or is it based on the Viva? Uh, is there an amount allocated for the report or just uh, the whole marks is allocated for the Viva? Uh, I didn't get to a question, uh, Imesh. Can I repeat the question? Okay, uh, it's like uh, if that is there a mark allocated for the uh, sorry the uh, report because if if not we can work uh, more on the model and then just outline the report and uh, present better at the viva uh, or else is there a mark allocated for the report content as well? Uh, yeah, uh, for the content as well, uh, uh, there will be mark allocated. Uh, so, like in the viva round, you don't have to pitch anything. Uh, the uh, judge panel will uh, ask quest direct questions based on your report. Uh, so, uh, to both your questions and uh, to your answers, uh, pardon me, uh, to your answers and also to content of the report, uh, you will uh, be uh, the marks will be allocated. Uh, sure, thank you. And uh, Tenuka, I think we have a question in the chat as well. Uh, to answer that, uh, we will be distributing uh, the cooperation guidelines for the final round uh, right after uh, this masterclass. So uh, you will get the uh, document in your mail uh, and uh, you can ask further questions in uh, the WhatsApp group that we have created for the final round. Yes, from Octave side, there will be a bunch of data scientists will available uh, on Saturday. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, do communicate on, on the uh, media channel. Yeah, all the questions uh, can be directed to the uh, organizing committee and we'll be direct uh, the questions to the Octave uh, data scientist and uh, we'll prepare the answers. Okay, so, so hopefully this will be a good experience, you know, like, I mean, whether you, you know, be one or 15 or whatever it is. So this will be a good opportunity for you to understand how to crack a, like a real world use case. Uh, so this real world use case, you know, um, and this, we gave quite a bit of information about, you know, what is the data science and, you know, machine learning, all these things. And uh, hopefully that will open you quite a bit of a, uh, thinking as well, and also like some areas as well. For example, like if you are not really into like you know, data science modeling, so you can be like a, a visualization expert too. That's a, that's a huge area that data scientists actually working with that with those people, right? We, 
the people like Shashan, you know, we do need like uh, uh, their help and the guidance and you know how to you know show these uh, insights and come up with interventions, key insights on to the, the top management. You know? And if you are not interesting about the modeling part, it can still be like a data analytics. Data engineer as well. You, if you're not that interesting about data engineering, so you can be a delivery side too, where you heavily work in the business domains, where you try to um, fill the gaps between uh, business and uh, data science teams. You, know? uh, you need so uh, we need uh, people uh, like that too. Uh, so there are some people who are wanted to join with data science team, but they are not you know like really into maths and stats and stuff. But there's a path too. Uh, you can be a uh, delivery, delivery lead uh, at the end end of your career, right? Uh, so that's a, that's a big, 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 uh, big career actually to be in the delivery side. Uh, even at Octave, there's a there's a department, so we have like uh, uh, quite a bit of de delivery leads and also delivery managers, delivery associates who are heavily working with the business. Yeah, so I mean, uh, there's a bunch of bunch of areas uh, you, know, uh, you guys can work on in, in this this. Uh, this data science, uh, data science stream. Okay. Okay, uh, then it's up to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Hello? Germany, are you in the call? Uh, yes, guys, if you have uh, any more questions, please put them in the chat. If not, we are going to end this session. We'll wait a couple of minutes. This will be the final chance that you get to clear your doubts before the finals. Did you guys at least learn Something from the from the case studies and you know those sessions. This is the most important thing. You know, it's not about you know we, you become the one. Uh, so hopefully we wanted to make sure that you know uh, you guys have. Uh, we wanted to give you quite a bit of information for you to learn and, and do some amazing things. You know, in Sri Lanka or even in, in international level, right? So hopefully these sessions help you to uh, you know, understand these fields a little bit more and uh, also some of the areas and also how to crack these uh, the real world use cases as well. I mean, all of you guys have you know, come to this point. It's, it's not easy to ask too. Um, so. Seems like we don't have any more questions. So I think now we can conclude the session. Before that, uh, let me grab this opportunity to thank the outstanding professionals, Dr. Rajita Navaratna, Mr. Tiraj Silva, and Ms. Shashini Gregory, who joined hands with us today amidst their busy schedules. Thank you very much. And I think we should all agree that we were able to witness a very insightful session today, just before the final round commences. And hopefully our team members from all 15 teams are very confident to face the finals of DataStorm 2.0, thanks to three of you. It was a great honor to have you here with us today. All the very best to our mem team members for the upcoming final round. I would like to remind all of you once again that we will be having the case crack for the final round on the 27th of March from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And the Viva round will be for all 15 teams and it will be held on 28th of March from 10 a.m. until 12 noon. The business pitch will only be available to the top five teams selected from the quick case crack, and it will be held uh, from 3 p.m. onwards on 28th of March. We will be announcing the winners of DataStorm 2.0 through the Facebook premiere, which will be premiered on 29th from 7 p.m. onwards. So with that, we will be concluding Masterclass 2.0 of DataStorm 2.0. We hope all we hope that all of our enthusiastic partakers of Masterclass 2.0 today were able to clarify your doubts and gain the tips and tricks needed to tackle and last the round of the last round and boost your confidence. We are looking forward to seeing you next time as well. 
Stay tuned until the finals. Stay safe and have a good night. Thank you for the session. Thank you.